Right, to get started, perhaps if I introduce a little bit more about myself. Um, as Rob's already said, I'm the Retail Laboratory Manager here at Tussug Product Service. I've got 21 years of experience in testing and product approvals and have worked for Electrolux, TV Product Service, Underwriters Laboratory and Ericsson Television. My contact details here are here as well, phone number and email um, if you wish to communicate with me after the event. Okay, so today we're going to have a look at consumer products, managing risk. Um, I've broken that down into some topics. As you can imagine, there's a lot of material that could be discussed um, in a 40 minute or so presentation. I'm not going to be able to cover everything in detail, which is why we're encouraging you to send some questions in if uh, issues aren't being covered or you need further clarification. But what I intend to do today is to look at an overview of an uh, imported consumer product life cycle, um, a brief overview of CE marking requirements, this will be very brief, um, risks faced with importing or imported products, how we can manage these risks and what the possible consequences can be if we don't take relevant action. Okay, so starting off, what we're going to do is look at the product life cycle itself. And what I've done is a very simple flow diagram to represent this. This uh, flow diagram will appear several times during this presentation with various things annotated on it. But basically what we're looking at is typical life cycle of imported products that we see would be there's a new product available from an overseas event vendor, for example, in China. A buyer selects that product, goes into mass production, shipped to Europe, received by an importer and then either placed directly on the market by that importer or resold to some other party or retailer who are then going to place the product on the market and then of course finally the consumer buys the product. So in principle a fairly simple process. And As I said before, later on in this presentation we will see various things happening at various stages during this process. Okay. Moving on, looking at CE marking, uh, very briefly, what is CE marking, what is it intended to be? Well, CE marking is really in place to enable the free movement of goods around the European marketplace. So it's not really, CE marking on products isn't really intended as such to be evidence of compliance and testing. What it is, is a, a manufacturer or importer taking responsibility for the products that they're placing on the marketplace. Obviously the intent behind that is that products have been properly tested and that forms the basis of someone applying CE marking. But as um, some of you I'm sure may, may have had experience that perhaps products come in from outside of the European Union, people know that CE marking has to appear on the product so they put it on the product without necessarily doing all the relevant testing that would be required to justify that. CE marking relates to specific European directives such as low voltage directive, EMC, toy directive, machinery directive, um, various other directives as well. There, there are also directives in Europe um, which don't call up CE marking. There's something called the General Product Safety Directive which uh, I'm sure I'll mention again before the presentation's out. So essentially CE marking is what I would call self-certification. So something that somebody applies to their own product or a product that they're importing and putting that product on the marketplace. It's not something that's given by a third party. Um, it's nothing to do with any certification schemes or anything like that. Um, and I think, as I've already said, it's not evidence in itself that a product complies. It's the, the information that goes behind that CE marking, so having a technical file, having copies of reports and evidence that the product's been properly tested to the relevant directives that's important. Okay, declaration of conformity. Uh, hopefully most of you will know that in order to, or to back up CE marking, you will need to pr prepare a declaration of conformity. What a declaration of conformity is, is a formal declaration that products comply with the relevant directives that are applicable to it, 
and would normally also contain the applicable standards that have been applied as the evidence that the product's been uh, tested to suitable standards to demonstrate compliance. This declaration of conformity has to be signed by a responsible person either from the manufacturer or the importer or retailer of the product. The responsibility is within the European Union. Laws relating to CE marking and placement of products on the market only apply within the European Union. They're European laws um, and therefore they're not enforceable against manufacturers and factories in China and other locations. So somebody in Europe has to take responsibility for products being placed on the European marketplace. Um, and see, the declaration of conformity is the minimum legal requirement for placing products on the market with CE marking. So um, the declaration of conformity in itself is not evidence of compliance. It's a, it's a, it's a statement or a declaration, it, yes, uh, you're taking responsibility for those products um, and saying that yeah, those products do meet the directive, but it's just a statement to that effect. The actual evidence will be test reports and certificates and things that you're able to produce to show that the relevant testing has been conducted. Okay, you've probably heard the term due diligence mentioned quite a lot. Um, this is perhaps a term that can be interpreted in, in different ways by different people. The, the sort of guidelines I'm putting here are just how we would view it, certainly from Tufsud point of view, um, is knowing what's required. So you have to find out what's applicable to your product. Then you have to demonstrate compliance with those requirements, i.e. the relevant directives and standards. Um, being properly prepared for if things go wrong, if you get challenged, perhaps training standards get involved with the product, you've got evidence on file in your technical file that you're confident will back you up and if should the worst come to the worst you get called into court you have information and things to support the case that you've done everything that can be reasonably expected of you to ensure that the products that you're placing onto the market meet the relevant requirements and don't pose any kind of hazard to people and consumers who are actually the end customer. So although many consumers and retailers perceive CE marking as a quality mark, it's not a quality mark in itself. And in fact, other evidence that goes behind that CE marking is kind of more important in terms of demonstrating safety, compliance, etc., than the CE marking on the product or the packaging itself. Okay, so that was a very brief overview of CE marking. Now I want to go in and look at the kind of risks that you get faced with um, or concerns you may have with importing products. So I'm going to start off looking at testing of products. So you're buying a product from somewhere. Has the product been properly tested at source? Perhaps the factory says, oh, yeah, no problem. We've got test reports for that product. Are the test reports from accredited testing laboratories, are they to the correct standard? Do the model names and numbers in the reports match the branding and marking on the product itself? Are the, are the reports up to the date? Normally we would recommend that test reports are less than two years old. Are they tested or certified as products? So that a difference um, between testing and certification. Testing would, would be just a simple, or, submit a sample to a lab, it's been tested, you have a test report on that one-off sample. If you have certification, for example, GS marking you may have heard of, obviously as Tufts said, we offer certification with our Octagon logo and things on. If you have certification, then there are factory inspections and other aspects which are required of the manufacturer in order to ensure the ongoing quality of the units. You're not going to get that if the product's just been tested. So having certification will be a, a useful tool. I think I'm going to speak about that a little bit more later on when we come into um, some of the other slides. Um, have all the relevant requirements met? Are, are the test reports that you've received actually addressing all the relevant clauses of the standard as limiting testing being done? Um, you know, there's a whole load of issues with the testing that may on face value appear to be okay, or perhaps in the hands of somebody who doesn't know a test report, well, we've got a test report, we put it on file. 
Um, it's not that simple. We see a lot of situations where the testing or reports and evidence that are provided by manufacturers doesn't adequately or match the products, um, and therefore we have to raise concerns with, with, with our clients to for them to go back and, and clarify what the situation is. Okay, so I've looked at testing. The other the other major side of things is the actual quality of the products themselves. So the typical kind of things we might see are products that are supplied and not the same as what was initially ordered, they're not made of the same parts and materials, they might look similar, or may, in, in some cases we've had situations where what's turned up really is something quite different to what the buyer thought they were selecting at a trade show. The product's not of the same build standard as the samples submitted for testing, so the, the way we would sort of look at this would be um, a, a factory making special, maybe gold samples, for submission to get testing or certification issued on a product and then what actually comes out of mass production is not to the same build standard. Products are maybe cost reduced so they've swapped out components for cheaper or materials for cheaper alternatives to reduce their costs. Perhaps the mass production stuff isn't even being made in the same factory, they're subcontracting it out somewhere else products that don't really work or function properly or unreliable um, and, a, and a common cause of, cause of problems is just poor quality instruction manuals badly written so they don't explain clearly how to use the product. Um, we've seen a look, quite a lot of complaints and returns that have been as a, as a result of just poor quality documentation being provided with the product. Also there's the issue of uh, own branding and uh, you know putting your own company name or a trade name or something like that onto products that you're importing from China that you don't have an awful lot of control over perhaps the quality and integrity of you want to make you know be making sure that if you're getting things branded in your own name and perhaps you're changing the model numbers and some of the markings that appear on the product that reports and certificates associated with that product actually match up with the product that's being placed on the market. If you've got test reports with a different model number and something written on, even though it essentially is the same product, there's potentially going to be an issue if there's a problem with the product that you, your evidence doesn't, doesn't match up. There are things such as what are called co-license certificates, or certainly within our organisation, where we can issue another certificate with different branding for a product without retesting the product. We work with the factory and they can request that we issue additional certificates against the testing they've had done in specific client and model names. Have you made any changes to the product or the specification for the product that may affect the fact that yeah it has been tested originally but actually you've asked for some changes of that product that could invalidate the testing as well. And One of the biggest uh, concerns really with putting branding is what I call brand association where if a consumer is not happy with the product they associate their dissatisfaction with the brand on that product. Um, so for example if you're importing products and you leave the branding that's from the importer on there then the consumer may go oh it's a, an ABC brand product they're not associating it with you as a specific retailer or, or seller of products, they're just associating it with that particular manufacturer or type of product. If you're putting your name on these products, you know, you're associating your brand, your reputation with them. So, you know, you really do want to be confident that these products are of good quality, high standard. I certainly wouldn't wouldn't want to personally be putting my name on products that oh, I didn't feel 100% confident were, were of good enough quality to stake my reputation again. What's the result of these issues? Potential high product complaints and returns, unsafe or dangerous products ending up on the marketplace, the possibility of having product recall or withdrawal from the market enforced on you, consumer dissatisfaction and a loss of brand integrity, all you know, quite significant consequences.
ultimately all of these things will result in the key factor which will be a loss of revenue or profit as a business. Okay, so that's sort of looked at the kind of issues that could be faced. By no means is that an exhaustive list, but I think it certainly sets the scene for some of the things we can now, or steps that we can now take in terms of managing the risks and the kind of things we should be looking at doing when we're importing products. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm going to cover now. I'm not suggesting that everybody has to do all of these items. It's a case of selecting what would be appropriate steps for you to take as an organisation um, in order to show that you've taken due diligence and done what can be reasonably expected of you. So first of all, I'm going to look at compliance testing, um, where that can take place. Ideally, testing's already been completed by the factory and they've got testing and certification, so when the product's selected, they can provide you with all the relevant documents to support, support it and hopefully minimise the amount of further action that you would need to take. Perhaps the buyer requests or specifies that certification and testing needs to be in place on the product in order to ensure that it's in place when the product is shipped into the European Union. The other possibility is that testing doesn't get organised until samples are, are actually within Europe or it's arranged by the importer um, with the factory to take place um, before shipment of the product. So this may also, similar arrangements may also be made by the final retailer of the product rather than the, the importer. What we need to be considering is, has all the relevant testing on the product been done? Have we done safety, EMC, toy, telecom, environmental pressure, whatever directives and requirements are applicable, has relevant testing been done to back that up? What we need to do to, to ensure that we're not taking risks at an early stage is to ensure that when we're buying and selecting products that the people who are making those decisions to select the products are aware of the legal requirements and what kind of testing and things will be needed. In some cases, if you ask for tested or certified products, they may actually be more expensive, so that may need to be something that you need to factor into commercial decisions. You don't want to be making decisions about testing and certification after you've already made commercial arrangements with a vendor, because they're probably going to tell you that you've got to pay extra money. Um, I think, as I've already said, it's, it's definitely best to select products that already have certification in place on them. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is a situation, uh, not all products fall within the scope of CE marking. However, there is something called the General Product Safety Directive, or GPSD, which is a catch-all directive. It's not a CE marking directive, but it requires accountability for anybody placing products onto the European marketplace to be accountable for the safety of those products to ensure that they're not going to cause any harm or damage. Um, so although that's not related to CE marking, it is related to showing due diligence and showing that you've taken relevant steps to ensure that the products you place on the market are safe. So just because CE marking directives may not be applicable to certain types of product doesn't mean that you don't need to consider some kind of testing requirements to ensure that what you're doing is safe. Um, what you need to be aware of is that declarations of conformity, particularly supplied, say, from factories from China, have no real value and they're not evidence in themselves of testing. If someone can only provide you with a declaration that isn't sufficient. You need to have the test reports or certificates that would go behind any declaration to show that the relevant testing has been done. Okay, moving on. Look at factory and shipping inspections. Factory inspections would, as the name would imply, happen at the location of, of production of the units. Um, that might be ISO 9000, it might be as part of um, certification. So, for example, if we certify products, we will insist that part of that relationship and the permission to use our mark is that we have to go in and audit that factory location 
at least once a year, um, sometimes up to four times a year. It could also be for ethical auditing reasons if you have policies as an organisation to be uh, ensure that um, your products are manufactured in an ethically sound environment, then inspections would need to take place at the manufacturing location to make sure that, that that's actually happening. There's also pre-shipment and post-shipment inspections, which would be checking of samples before and after shipping of the products. And the kind of objectives of these uh, inspections are, are outlined here, um, obviously to ensure the ongoing compliance of certified products, so to make sure that on a regular basis we're getting into the factory, we're checking that what's being made is the same as what was originally tested, the same components and materials are being used, making sure that products are being tested and checked um, as required in production to ensure that they're safe before they go out the door. They can also be for verification of quality management systems, so ID use, using manufacturers who are ISO 9000 accredited, so they have a quality system which helps to ensure that they've got the right processes and procedures in place to control and monitor um, their production and testing um, in a reliable fashion. Ethical auditing, as I've already mentioned, to look at working conditions for staff, employment of children, these kind of things, living conditions, facilities provided. can also be inspections that are done to specific retailer requirements. So we regularly get asked to go in, perhaps if it's a new factory for a new product, to go in and check a whole bunch of specific criteria that our client wishes the product to meet up to. So maybe over and above what are one of our normal inspections, it may be quality issues, even matching of colors, certain functional checks and things like that they want done to make sure that the products that are coming out of production really are up to the required standard. So it's really, yeah, as I've summarized at the end there, ensuring that products meet the expected quality and safety standards. So I'll put here some typical sort of objectives of, of what a pre or post shipment inspection would involve. Inspection of goods to appraise whether or not you actually receive, what you're actually receiving is the same as what you've ordered or you've got a contractual agreement you know, what is what's turning, what's going to turn up and arrive to you, the same as what you're expecting. And also look at accessing the overall build quality, taking samples apart, looking at the way they've put together. Normally when these report, uh, inspections are carried out, the inspector has photographs, pictures, a lot of information about the products themselves, a checklist of items to go through and establish whether what's coming out of production is up to the required standard. Also checking that mandatory markings and things are on there, such as CE marking where it's required, things like that. Also would, would cover packaging, marketing, marking, labelling, audit against purchase order requirements, etc. So these are, these are the kind of the typical things, but they're very much things that can be tailored to specific requirements. What, what, what a shipment or pre or post shipment inspection is really out there to do is to help protect you as an importer by ensuring that what you're, you're actually getting, what you receive, is the same as what you were actually expecting in the first place. And that you're not going to get a container load of, of product that you can't sell. Okay, there's also something more I loosely termed as retailer product checks. So these are other things that a retailer can be doing to ensure uh, or give themselves confidence double checking that, that things are done. And that might be getting pre production samples released for a screening check or quick inspection. So, although products are maybe you have test reports and things together and things are starting to look good, but you want to feel confident before you start going into mass production, so you request some pre production samples to be sent and evaluated. It's something we certainly do for some of our clients. Um, where they arrange for the factory to send the samples over here because they prefer dealing with us in the in the UK and feel more confident in, in working locally. Or maybe when samples have been received by the importer or the retailer, that samples are then sent for an independent verification or screening check to make sure that um, no fundamental areas have been missed out. 
to what the typical objectives of these kind of product checks are. You know, they're, they're going to be quick checks. They're not going to be expensive, lengthy things like the formal testing, but it's a, it's a double check to help ensure that you've got things in place like um, reports, certificates that you've got for the product would be checked and validated to make sure that they're suitable, match the product, that the testing laboratory that's carried out the testing is competent, the user manual is suitable, um, written in good English, um, matches the product, that the overall build quality and safety of the product is okay, so the product would be taken apart and checked, and maybe some basic electrical safety checks would be carried out. Looking at essential markings and warnings that you're required to have on them, making sure they're all in the right place. For the UK, checking that you've got the correct plug, cord and fuses on there. A lot of products are shipped all around the world. We're starting to see a number of products coming into the Europe, into the UK marketplace that are now turning up without three-pin UK plugs and maybe some some kind of travel adapters and things like that being supplied. So, making sure that what turns up in the in the UK is ready to go into the into the UK market. Um, conduct basic functional checks, so carry out some tests to make sure that essentially the product does what it's supposed to do and check that the packaging, et cetera, for the product is suitable and has suitable markings and labelling on as well. So that's the kind of things that can be done at a later stage in the product's life cycle. Um, and the final sort of area to look at within the life cycle is complaints and returns. So the consumer's got the product, they're unhappy with the product, the quality is the product defective, it doesn't work properly, doesn't do what they're expecting, perhaps the user instructions don't explain clearly enough to them how to use the product, or perhaps the product's been considered to be unsafe, perhaps an incident's occurred where something's caught fire or someone's claiming that they've had an electric shock. So complaints and returns from customers or from enforcement authorities obviously could be potentially very damaging to your business in terms of cost and repu reputation. Um, what you should be doing if you're in a situation where there, there's a, a genuine complaint and you don't, certainly don't feel confident to, to make a definitive decision yourself as to whether the consumer's at fault or whether the product's at fault, you should seek independent advice from someone who's competent in testing or evaluation of products to do an investigation to see if they can determine the cause of the problem um, and provide an independent uh, report or feedback to h help you make the right decision about how you proceed with that. Um, ensuring that correct testing and inspection are implemented at an early stage minimises the risk. So for some of the things I've already talked about, about getting testing done, making sure you've got reports and certificates, checking things out, what that's going to do is minimise the risk of you having a product that's going to have high levels of, of returns and complaints. Managing your product integrity protects your brand name. So what, what we're talking about here is to, all, all the kind of things that I've been talking about already, doing what you can do to make sure that the product that you're putting on the marketplace is not going to come and cause you a problem later on. You want to make sure that, yeah, all the testing's in place, the quality of the product that you're putting out there, you can feel confident that you're going to be able to put it out there and you've minimised the risk of having issues with that product. You can never fully eliminate them. It doesn't matter how much testing or certification you do. There's always going to be some risk that at least isolated samples of a product can have a defect in and cause a problem for the consumer. But what you can certainly do is minimise the levels that that's likely to occur at. Um, and finally, on this subject, OEM branding is a, is an increasing market. So, putting your own people putting their own branding name onto products that they're importing, perhaps where they've had not an awful lot, if any, input into the design or the quality of the product. Um, you know, as I've mentioned earlier, this is putting a company's name and reputation against products in, in, in a more serious way than if you're selling products which are branded by the manufacturer. High returns and, and product recalls can, can ruin brand name and reduce or destroy profitability on these products. I've certainly had experience in, in my time here with uh, one or two situations where customers have branded a product um, with their own name, it's been sold in their stores and then it's 
transpired that actually there's a bit of an issue with the product and they've had to recall it, put recall notices up in, in their stores. You know, it's cost them a lot of money, time and effort and it's damaging to their reputation. Okay, how can you minimize your risks? You can select products which have already been tested and certified. You can request pre-production samples and compliance documentation and get that evaluated at an early stage. Get your buyers, when you're sourcing products, to be doing that. You can ensure that the factories where its products being made is got a quality system in place and that they're being regularly audited to ensure the quality of manufacturing is at a good standard. You can look at doing some form of pre or post shipment inspection, um, particularly if you're taking in large quantities of shipments in one go, you know, spending uh, a relatively small amount of money with a suitable organisation who can go and do these inspections could potentially stop you from shipping a whole bunch of defective product. Send samples in for what I've called retail checks, screening checks, um, to make sure that there aren't any things that have slipped through the net before you put the product onto the marketplace. Uh, and if you do end up in a situation where you have a return or complaint, something that maybe is going to be taken further, that you get independent advice um, and a, an assessment of the product to ensure that um, you've, you've got something to show that you've got an independent point of view, not just your point of view and the customers, but actually somebody who's looked at it for, from outside to give a, you know, a definitive opinion. So what, what I've got now is just some examples of the kind of things that can happen if you don't protect yourself. There's a number of examples here which have been pulled off of something called the RAPEX, RAPEX directory, which is something that's run by the European Commission. It's a database of products that have been recalled from the European marketplace. Um, there are weekly reports available which you can get from um, the Europa website, which is the official website of the European Union. Okay, what can happen? Well, unsafe products can be placed onto the market. They can injure consumers, maybe by electric shock or fire, or um, mechanical hazards, cutting, nipping, pinching, something like this. Maybe enforcement action might be taken. In this country, it would be by trading standards, which could result in prosecution, legal action, requirement to recall products from the marketplace. Poor quality placed on products on the market, you're going to get customer complaints at returns at a high level, which is going to cause you a loss of revenue and, uh, as I've already mentioned, you know, loss of brand integrity with, with own branded products. What can happen? Defective products can catch fire in a consumer's home. Poor quality products can break whilst in use and cause injury to consumer. And I've got some actual examples of products here. These, as I said, were pulled from this um, directory that's available on the European Union website. This particular toaster had insufficient insulation, so the case temperature was getting very, very, very hot. There are limits for how hot, even on the toaster, which obviously does get hot to cook toast, there are limits for certain surfaces and areas on the toaster in here well over uh, 100 degrees C, which could cause quite a nasty burn just from a, a very short-term contact with it. And also, it also had inadequate earthing, which was posing a risk of electric shock. What measures were taken? The product was removed from the market and banned from sale. The deep fat fryer, the product overheats and poses a risk of burns to the operator. In this case, the, uh, the, the retailer of this product has voluntarily removed it from the marketplace. Laser pointer, there's a limit for how powerful the lasers are permitted to be. In this case, the laser was four times the permittable level, which obviously runs a risk of burn hazard to somebody's eyes. Um, again, a recall was required and it was prohibited from sale. We've got an extension cord set here. Dimensions were incorrect of the socket outlets, making it very difficult to actually plug things in and out. 
There were excessive temperatures of parts when the unit was tested under full load. There were insufficient insulation distances in there. The, rate, the power cord rate in was insufficient for the load that was being carried. So you can see, you know, on quite a simple product that doesn't have a lot in it, most of it actually seemed to be wrong here. Again, stop from sale, recall from the market. Fan heater here, the, the actual plastic cover becomes soft um, during use and allows access to live or moving parts within the fan. Um, also, some of the crimped connections inside were, were of a poor quality, which could result in arcing, overheating, etc., occurring when electrical contacts break down or fail. Again, a recall from the market was required for this product. We've got a sort of multimedia speaker system here. A risk of electric shock and fire because of adequate insulation between uh, the primary and secondary of the transformer and the insulation actually met on the transformer was melting under fault conditions. Um, again, recall ordered from the market by the uh, market authorities. Hot water bottle for children. The lid of the hot water bottle was too small, which means it could, could cause young children to choke on it. There's a, there's a minimum size that hot water bottle tops would need to be. Um, in this case, the samples that were recovered were destroyed and the product was prohibited from sale. Um, an expanding spider toy, this is one of these things that you put it in water and it expands to something like, well, 600% of its size. If you can imagine if, if a child puts that in, a, in their mouth or it gets caught in their, their, their throat in any way and it starts expanding because of saliva, it, it runs a real risk of of suffocation and there are you know these these kind of products have to be removed from the marketplace very dangerous there have been reported incidents of um, fatalities as a result of these kind of products um, trampoline well, pretty clear from the picture there's a there's obviously a, a very real risk of these trampolines um, collapsing the legs have given way underneath um, obviously the potential if someone was on there and this happened for quite a nasty injury to occur Again, there was a recall of the product and it was immediately stopped from sale once this was, was identified. Steam cleaner, in this case the steam escaping all around the product where it shouldn't be. This was as a result of a defect inside um, where one of the tubes was broken, steam was escaping um, and was posing the risk of scolding to the user and there was a stop of sale, the product was removed from the market. Okay, so that uh, finishes a fairly whistle-stop presentation. Hopefully there's been some useful information there. I'm just going to run through what we've covered. We've looked at an overview of the basic life cycle of an imported product, a brief overview of CE marketing, declarations of conformity. We've looked at the risks faced with importing products, how you can manage your risks, and what can happen if you don't protect yourself. So thanks very much for listening. Um, uh, and I look forward to speaking to you all soon.